Okay, opening text today is John chapter 13, verse 34 through 35. I find it interesting. I, I got the, put the song list together before the message. And as we're singing, I'm realizing that the song list goes right with the message. How many of you know that's a God thing? <clears throat> John, four, John 13, verse 34 through 35, Jesus is talking. And he says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. And then going to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 12 through 13. 1 Thessalonians 3, 12 through 13. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all, just as we do to you so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. The title of my message today is, Love is Key. Love is Key. According to Jesus, <clears throat> love is a key element that identifies his followers. Not everyone who loves is a follower of Jesus, but everyone who is a follower of Jesus must be one who loves. Does that make sense? In the world, there are many different ideas of what love is and what it's supposed to look like. It may vary from culture to culture. It may vary from generation to generation. And because of it, it's hard for us to nail down what the world describes as love. But how many of you know that God makes it very clear in Scripture what love is and what love is not? Jesus, God, makes it very clear what the definition of love is supposed to, what the definition of love is and what it's supposed to look like in the lives of his followers. In the opening text in John, Jesus speaks of our love for one another. But in 1 Thessalonians, the apostle Paul indicates that this love we are to have is to flow out to everyone and not just among followers of Christ. In Matthew 24, or Matthew 22, verse 34 through 40, as well as in Luke 10, 29 through 37, we read two accounts of a conversation Jesus had with a lawyer. How many of you know that's probably an interesting conversation? In his attempt to test Jesus and find some error in Jesus' teachings, this lawyer asked Jesus which is the great commandment in the law. Jesus answers by quoting two passages in the Old Testament. The first one is in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5, which speaks of loving God with all our heart, all our soul, and with all our strength. How many of you know that's the number one commandment of the Ten Commandments? Loving God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. But Jesus then follows that up by quoting Leviticus 19.18, which speaks of loving our neighbor as ourselves. It's been said if you look at the Ten Commandments, you'll find that those two commandments, love the Lord thy God with all, thy heart, with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, or love others as yourself, all en encompasses all Ten Commandments. It, it doesn't, it's not like it does away with any of them. It encompasses it all. And so Jesus is basically trying to simplify it. Love God with everything within you, but love others as you love yourself and love others as he has loved you. Makes it simple. Makes it easy. Doesn't mean it's easy to love people because some people are pretty hard to love. Some people are unlovable. Some people are difficult. They grate at you. They say things. They do things that just ruffles your feathers, so to speak. You know what I'm saying? And it's just, it's hard. But how many of you know that it's important for us to be able to love them if we are followers of Christ? That's important. Speaking of the last days, many will quote or point to Matthew 24 verse 12 through 13. 
because it describes the days we are living in and to demonstrate that we are living in the last days. What does that passage says? It says, and because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. While that's true in the days that we're living in, and it's pointing us to the, the final seven-year period, the tribulation period, this passage is referring specifically to the tribulation period in context. But we see so many things with the tribulation period casting this very dark shadow on our life today, not just in our lives individually, not just in Deming, Luna County, New Mexico, the United States, but globally, we're seeing things happening that's casting a very dark shadow of what the Bible calls the tribulation period. It's evident that people and even some Christians, because of lawlessness, their love is growing cold in the days we are living in. And if we're seeing that today, how much closer does that mean the tribulation period is to being started? And how bad is it? If we're seeing it bad now, how bad is it going to be during that period of time? I don't know about you, but I don't want to be here then. I don't want to see it. I don't want to experience it. I want to be gone. How many of you would say amen? <laughs> when we talk of lawlessness, we generally identify it by the general disregard of people for the ethical and moral laws of man. But what about lawlessness regarding the laws and commands of God? Has God commanded us certain things of us? Has God commanded us, commanded certain things of us as individuals? And are we being obedient to those commands? It's not just about whether a person is deliberately disobeying traffic laws. You know, the speed limit says 55 and someone decides to do 60, 65, you know? Or who cares about running that, stopping at that stop sign? It's in the middle of nowhere. No one's around. I can see. So, you know, there's a disregard, a disobedience to those in authority, but that's, a, that's an attitude of lawlessness. We decide what laws we're going to abide by and what not. That's an attitude of lawlessness in our hearts. But what we're talking about today is, are we being rebellious towards God and the things that God has for us in our lives individually and as followers of his? Just because a person isn't seen as lawless or rebellious in the eyes of the world does not mean that God does not see rebellion in our hearts. We, some, we so many times look at a person, we say, oh, they're living right or they're not, but we don't see their heart. There's, there's people that they can go through the motions, they can talk the talk, they can walk the walk, they can look great, but in their heart, they're in rebellion. They have a, an attitude of lawlessness in their heart because they're, they're not being obedient to God. What did Jesus say? It's not even in my notes. In Matthew chapter 7, I think it's verses 21 and 20 and 21, he says, there's going to be many that are going to say, Lord, Lord, did we not cast out demons in your name? Did we not heal the sick? Did we not do all these different things? They'll have this impressive spiritual resume that might put some of us to shame and he's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. You workers of iniquity, you who practice lawlessness. They may have been doing it all right on the outward. They may have been having this stellar resume as a spiritual leader or whatever, but in their heart, they're in rebellion and disobedience to God. And because of that, God says, I never knew you. I pray this never us. Matthew records in Matthew 5, 43 through 48, what godly love looks like and how it is to be lived out in the lives of his followers. Matthew 5, 43 through 48, Jesus is talking. And he says, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. 45, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. 
For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brethren, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. What Jesus is describing here is, you know, when he says be perfect even as the Father in heaven is perfect, doesn't mean that we have perfection in our life. It means that we are exhibiting perfect love towards others like he has loved us. That's what he's talking about. We have to realize, even if we know that someone is our enemy, they want to seek and destroy us, just because we know that someone wants to curse us or do things they hate us, even though they, we know that they spitefully use us, they took advantage of us, they are trying to um, wreak havoc in our lives, no matter what, we are to still love them. How many of you know in the flesh that's a tough thing to do? But at the same time, how many of you realize that is a fruit of the Spirit, love, and that is we are the recipients of God's love. God's love for us is without... Um, well, let me put it this way. There's a minister... Years ago, I heard him say this. He says, there is nothing in this world, there's nothing in your life that you can say or do to make God love you more because there is nothing in your life. Um, no, I got it wrong. There's nothing you can do in your life to make him love you less. Boy, am I getting that turned around. There's nothing you can do in your life to make God love you more because he loved you enough while you were still a sinner. You, he, 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 his love for you is not going to grow because of something you said and did. Does that make sense? Sometimes we think that his love is conditional on whether or not we are doing this and that or whatever. He loves us. And we had to have that same kind of love. When we speak of this thing called love, at least here in America... We tend to view love as merely an emotion one feels. And if someone no longer feels love, then they have fallen out of love for others. While it is true that love can involve emotions and feelings, we need to remember that biblical love, godly love, is not based on emotion, but rather a commitment to a choice to love others even when we do not want to or feel like it. That's biblical love. That's godly love. If we are ambassadors for Christ, how many of you know we need to be exhibiting that same love to others that Christ has poured out on us? 1 Corinthians chapter 13, we call it the love chapter. I want to look at verses 4 through 8, which gives a description of what biblical, godly love is, a love that we are commanded to have. Verse 4, love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself it's not puffed up. It does not, behave, it does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, and what that part, thinks no evil, means keeps no record of wrong. Okay? Verse 6, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. I was going to read it to you from the Amplified, but it's on my phone, and my phone is recording, so I can't get to it right now. But when you really look at this, this is a pretty simple and basic description of godly love. And my question to you is, 
How much of that are we seeing in the world today? Or not? How much of that are we seeing within Christian circles today? Or not? Even within Christian circles, we're, we're dealing with people that are impatient. They're not kind towards others. They're jealous. They're, they're envious because of, oh, that person got this, or that person did this, or whatever. We tend to get parade ourselves like we're some hot shot. We're something to do. We're some bigwig. People need to be, you know, taking notice of us. We have Christians that behave rudely. How many of you know what it means to be rude? Whether it's us being rude to them or them being rude to us. Love does not behave rudely. Love does not seek its own. That's a tough one. Because we're always wanting to look out for ourselves. What's in, what's in our best interest? What, how's it going to benefit me? It's about my little world. Love is not provoked. How many of you know, we all have little triggers that people can push, and we can be provoked into saying and doing things that we ought not, that is not very loving. But love will not be provoked. Love does not keep a record of evil. How many of you have known people that have kept a record of everything you have said and done wrong in your life? How many of you, without raising your hand, have found yourself keeping a record of everything that someone else has said and done that has wronged you or someone you love? Godly love doesn't keep those records. And do you know what it means to not keep those records? If we don't keep those records, then how can we talk about them? How can we share them? How can, because if we're telling people about it, whether it's the person that's wronged us or something else, are we keeping a record of it? And is that really love? As we'll see later on, we find that that's not love when we have to or feel the need to share that. What about rejoicing in iniquity? Love doesn't rejoice when iniquity. We don't rejoice when someone's in sin or when there's an injustice, but we rejoice in the truth when truth is, is in play, when justice and righteousness is in play. Love bears all things. That's a tough shoulders for love to, to be able to handle the, the, the storms and the struggles of life. Love bears all things. It, it, it can handle it. It's not going to let it mess them up. Love believes all things. Love hopes all things. Hopes all things. Right now, it's coming to my mind. How can you hope if you're being negative and pessimistic, where's the hope? Love endures, en endures all things. Kind of like bears all things. It endures all things. It doesn't matter what it's going through. It doesn't matter what it's being dragged through. How many of you have felt like at times you're being dragged through the mud? And maybe in the mud there's rock and stones and glass and broken debris that's scratching you up even more. Love endures, in verse 8, love never fails. How many of you know it's a good thing that God's love never fails? Where would we be if God decided not to love us? Because we said something, because we did something, or we didn't say or do something that we should. God's love never fails, and that's the kind of love that we are to have in our lives towards others as well. Does that mean we acquire that overnight? No, it's something that's developed. It's, it's grown. There's maturity. You know, it's one of the fruit of the Spirit. It's, you know, how you produce fruit, you have to go through. If you're wanting patience, God's going to put you in situations where your patience is being attacked, and the Holy Spirit is going to say, Chill, John. Back up the truck. Slow down. Just go with the... Don't get impatient. 
but our flesh is screaming, no, it's got to be done now. It's not, you know, and, and, but the Holy Spirit says, be patient. When we're, we're, we're needing to have kindness, God, God is going to put us in situations where our flesh is not going to want to be kind to someone. And the Holy Spirit is going to say, no, 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 John, be kind. And the more we heed the, the, the leading of the Spirit, the more that fruit of, in that, case, in that case, kindness begins to develop within us and becomes more of a lifestyle. And for any of the fruit of the Spirit, even love, there's going to be times where we're going to be challenged to love or not to love people because of the way they're acting, because of things they say, because of different things. And the Holy Spirit is going to say, love them, love them. Don't let the flesh dictate to you. You know, we read in Galatians 5, the fruit of the flesh, anger and malice and all these different things. And yet we're supposed to be having the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, gentleness, kindness, long-suffering. We need God's love. This coincides with the standard by which Jesus and God knows that we love them. How many of you want to know how God and how Jesus knows we love them? Do they know that we love them because of all the emotion and excitement we have for him? Or because of all the zeal and the fiery emotion and what forth that we have for him? No. They know that we love them when we keep and obey their commands. <clears throat> the, pri the principal command they have for us is to first love them with all that is within us and second, to love others as ourselves. You know, how many times have you talked to someone, maybe it was you yourself that said it, I'm a good person, I haven't done anything wrong, I haven't committed murder, I haven't committed adultery, I haven't stolen, I haven't done this stuff. Yet we forget about commandment number one, loving the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the majority of the time, we, we may have kept all the others, but we've broken that one commandment. And Scripture tells us when we break one commandment, we've broken them all. In 1 John 5, 3, It says, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. He simplified it. Love him with everything within us and love others as well. Peter reminds us that love, fervent love will cover a multitude of sins. How many of you are grateful that God's love for you covers your sins? In Proverbs, we read that hatred stirs up strife, but again, love covers all sins. Covering sin does not mean that we are agreeing with or condoning the sin or even in denial of it. Some people think so, but that's not the case. Covering sin is out of love for that other person, we are not going to repeat it to others we're not going to hold them accountable. We're not going to hold it against them. It does not become gossip. And, and here's the question. Is our love for that person or group of people more important to us and how that can affect them and how they feel and how it could affect others viewing that person? Is that more important to us than our Freedom to share what we know about someone or something else. Sometimes we get our rights confused with God's love. And we think, well, it's my right. I have the freedom. I can share it. It's true, whatever. But God says love covers a multitude of sins. We're not going to be rehashing what, has, what was once said or done because we, are, we love that person. We want the best for them. We don't want to keep, how many of you have ever felt like, how many of you have ever blown it with someone? 
you royally blew it. Something you said, something you did, it doesn't matter if it was intentional or not, you blew it. And you felt bad, and you, you know, hey, can you forgive me? I, I blew it, whatever. And the person says, yeah, I forgive you. And, and that is like, thank you, you know, you're appreciative of it, you're grateful of it. But let, let, me, let me add a little twist to this. God, we've blown it with him. We ask for forgiveness, right? The Scripture says that he casts it as far as the east is from the west. How would we feel if we found out that he was telling someone else about the sin that he supposedly forgave us of? We wouldn't like that too good, huh? It makes make us wonder, did he really forgive me? You know, it's, we have to realize, is it our love for others or is it our love for our freedoms <laughs> that is more important to us? How does it affect others? You know, if God tells someone about something I did that he forgave me of, that doesn't make me feel good, but now I'm at odds with that other person because they, all, they have a picture of me that they shouldn't have if I really love them because I'm wanting the best for them. I'm wanting, you know, and, and what does that do? That only brings division. That only divides, that tears down the body. Peter says, above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. If we are appreciative of God covering in his love for us, all our sins, past, present, and future, we need to extend that same type of love for others and be willing to cover their sins with godly love. So, we need to pursue love for everyone. God loves everyone and commands us to love them as well. As I mentioned earlier in Matthew 5, 48, it says that we are to be perfect even as he is perfect. And that is in context talking about loving others as he loves us. If we are only greeting people that love us, people that like us, people that are friendly to us, we're no different than the tax collectors of Jesus' day. But if we're friendly, loving, cordial, kind to people that we know despise us, they hate us, they want to take advantage of us, that's godly love. That's when God says, you're excelling, you're growing, you're, you're starting to shine. You know, we're talking about letting him shine through us. We shine when his love flows through us to those around us. This includes those who do not believe as we do, those who do not share our political views and opinions, those who appear to be working to destroy the society and nation we once grew, we once knew and grew up in. This even includes family members who are contrary to us and what we think is right, just, and appropriate. This even includes those who teach and preach a false gospel message and who intentionally or unintentionally seek to lead others astray from the faith. Again, it doesn't mean that we're condoning, we're not saying that they're not doing something wrong, but we're exhibiting God's love towards them like he gave his love towards us. Loving people does not mean we agree, support, or embrace their views and agendas or their behaviors but rather that we are willing to not allow those differences to keep us from loving them as Christ has loved us, even while we were still sinners. 1 Corinthians 14, 1, <clears throat> part of it says, pursue love. Pursue love. Doesn't mean, doesn't mean we have to feel loving doesn't mean we have to be emotional about it. It just means that we are committed consciously 
to behave and to treat those people in a loving way as the Bible describes what love is and not contrary to that. So we want to love others and pursue loving others. And that's when we begin to be a light that shines for the world to see. That's when people see Jesus and not us. Because in the flesh, we don't want to love. In the flesh, we can't find enough excuses and reasons to nail a person to a wall. We can't find enough um, I can't, we, you know, we're, we're keeping track. Our flesh wants to do everything opposite of what godly love is. And that's no different than the world. But where we shine is when no matter what, we will still love. You know, I'm just picturing the, the Christians in the early church. I wonder when they were being persecuted, how much did God's love shine through them towards the person that was persecuting them? Putting them on a stake to set on fire. Putting them in a coliseum with hungry lions and beasts. Torture. How many of them looked at them with the eyes of Jesus who said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do, even though they knew what they were doing, but they didn't know? How many of them thought, God, yeah, they knew they're, they, they know they're throwing me in the, the den of lions, so to speak, but they really don't know what they're doing. Forgive them, Father, and, and have an attitude of love. And again, that's not something that the, that's, you flip it in, flip a switch, and you're there 30 seconds from now or overnight. It's something that is developed within us. It's a gift. It's a fruit of the Spirit of God. And there's going to be times in order to develop that fruit in us, He's going to put us in situations that challenges us. Are we going to respond in the flesh? Or are we going to follow the leading of the Spirit and choose to be loving towards that person despite the way we feel, despite the way we think, despite the emotion that we may have raging within us at that moment? Make sense? How many of you want the love of Christ to flow through you? You know, And the thing about it is that when Jesus comes back and that to, to receive his bride to himself without spot, without wrinkle, without blemish, I wonder how much of what he's looking at is going to be how much we are loving towards others. We may be doing, we may be like the people that had the impressive spiritual resume, but we're in disobedience. We're not loving. We're critical, we're judgmental. We're negative, we're about people and groups and whatever. I wonder how much that's going to play into whether or not he views us as a bride without spot and wrinkle. So our prayer today, my prayer today, and I pray it's all our prayers today is, Lord, help us to love others as you have loved us. He loved us while we were still sinners, condemned to hell, didn't matter what they said, didn't, ma didn't matter the, the lifestyle, didn't matter what sins we were involved in or how we had taken advantage of or whatever. He still loved us, and we have to extend that same love towards them. Amen? Father, we just come before you today. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your love. Because without your love, you would have never sent your son to die in our place and to be raised again the third day. Without your love, we would have no relationship with you. We would have no hope. We would have no, nothing to be joyful about, nothing to be thankful about, nothing to be grateful for, because we would be lost and dying. And so many in the world today are feeling that same way, but they don't realize how much you love them, and that how much you just... You didn't just say you love us. You showed that you loved us. And you continue to do that, even to the point of wanting to rescue us from the judgment that's coming. Help us to develop within us that love, your love, within us towards others. 
Help us to love others as you loved us. And in doing so, be in the light of the world, pointing people to your Son for salvation, for eternal life, for hope, for forgiveness, for grace, and for mercy, and for joy. We ask that in the precious name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. 